Hello, I'm Lisa Borden. I'm a staff attorney in international justice with the Advocates for Human Rights. Thanks for tuning in to the latest in our series of debriefings on the Universal Periodic Review sessions that are taking place in Geneva, Switzerland at the United Nations Human Rights Council. Today we'll be talking about the UPR of the Human Rights Record of the United States, which was conducted yesterday. With me today for this debrief are several great panelists. I'll take just a minute to introduce them. Uh, Carrie Brasser is an attorney and frequent volunteer for the advocates who has worked on a number of the issues that we'll be discussing today. My international justice colleague, Amy Bergquist, is a senior staff attorney with the advocates. Uh, Lindsay Greising is a staff attorney with the advocates in our research, education, and advocacy program, where she focuses on some of our core issues, including both human trafficking and immigration, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll also be joined by Michelle Garnett McKenzie, who is the Advocates Deputy Director of Advocacy and oversees our domestic pol policy priorities, including immigration, trafficking, and policing. And finally, Carter Mickelson is a program assistant in the International Justice Program with the Advocates. Uh, before we get started with our discussion of what happened yesterday, Amy's going to provide a brief overview of what the UPR is and how it works. Thanks, Lisa. So the graphic that should be coming up on your screen right now gives an overview of what the Universal Periodic Review or UPR is and I'll talk about sort of where we are in the process as well. As the name suggests, Universal Periodic Review is universal. Every country in the world goes through it. It's periodic, happens every five years, and it's a review of the country's human rights record with a view to how that record can be improved in the future. So for the United States, um, going back in time to the pre-COVID days of October 2019, that was step one. That was the preparation of information for review. That was when the Advocates for Human Rights and several different partner organizations submitted three different reports for the upcoming review of the United States. Um, those reports focused on death penalty, um, labor, um, labor exploitation and human trafficking, and immigration and asylum related issues. So we submitted those reports and a bunch of other people submitted reports on their issues as well. And then we go fast forward to what happened yesterday, that's step two of the process, the interactive dialogue. So that's a three and a half hour session in Geneva on the floor of the Human Rights Council, where the government has a chance to make presentations about what great things they've done over the last five years to improve human rights. And then all the countries in the world have a chance to chime in and give their two cents about what they think about human rights in that country. And most importantly, to make recommendations for what the country being reviewed should do in the future in the next five years to improve human rights in their country. Those recommendations are the real, really the key part of the process because um, looking forward in March, there will be adoption of the report and that's the deadline for the government that receives the recommendations to accept or reject those recommendations. And then the bulk of the work happens over the next four years, which is implementation. So any accepted recommendations, the government is supposed to be working hard, collaborating with civil society to make sure those recommendations are implemented. So that's what the UPR cycle is all about and where we are right now. Thank you, Amy. Um, uh, Amy has already mentioned that we submitted some stakeholder reports for this um, UPR session. In addition to that, we also made a formal statement to the Human Rights Council on systemic racism and the need for policing reforms in the U.S. Uh, so we're going to be talking about um, all those issues that we've mentioned today. Um, and I'll ask our panelists just to give a brief introduction to the submissions. Let's start with Carrie. Carrie, it looks like you. you're muted. There we go. Thanks, Lisa. Sorry about that. So after the killing of George Floyd this past May and the numerous protests and demonstrations that followed, the ever-present problem of police violence, especially vis-a-vis -vis black and brown communities, was brought into sharp relief in the United States. The advocates made a number of recommendations to urge the U.S. government to take steps in the area of police reform. We recommended that the U.S. adopt legislation targeted against racial profiling, that they establish independent oversight bodies with jurisdiction over police conduct that can actually conduct impartial investigations of all complaints of human rights violations. We recommended they conduct a full review of police procedures nationally and that they work with state and local authorities to provide training to law enforcement officers to promote compliance with international human rights standards. We also recommended that training be provided to law enforcement officers in de-escalation and other techniques and strategies to minimize the use of force. 
and we underscored that there must be accountability for police misconduct and recommended the collaboration with civil society, including black led organizations to formulate a plan to this end. And we were very happy to see that a large number of countries made recommendations to the US on the subjects of racism, police violence and police reform. And we will be discussing those in a few moments. Thank you, Carrie. Lindsay, could you bring us up to date on the labor exploitation and trafficking submission? Sure. So the um, Advocates for Human Rights worked with our partner, the uh, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos en la Lucha, CETUL, um, which is a workers' right organization based in Minnesota. Um, and based on our experience working on trafficking issues specifically around labor trafficking and our work um, on the intersection of trafficking with immigration, um, and CETUL's expertise in the area on labor exploitation and labor trafficking, we recommended that the U.S. provide legal migration pathways that are not tied to a single employer for low-wage low workers. We also recommended that the U.S. establish binding standards for requesting and approving continued presence that ensures victims are protected throughout their trafficking case. Um, we recommended that the U.S. remove requirements um, and increase the numbers of visas available related to T and U visas which are specific to victims of trafficking and victims of specific crimes. We also recommended that the U.S. require federal immigration enforcement officers to effectively and consistently screen for victims of trafficking. Um, we further recommended that the Federal Department of Labor expand its proactive investigations into industries with high rates of labor exploitation um, and fully fund federal and state labor enforcement agencies, including providing enough investigators per capita. Great, thank you, Lindsay. And Michelle, what about the submission on immigration issues? Great, um, so one moment, please. Um, so the last uh, five years have really been characterized by um, deteriorating conditions for immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in the United States uh, relating to enforcement increased investment in enforcement mechanisms and increased detentions and deportations, uh, and also to the erosion of the right to seek and enjoy asylum in the United States. And to that end, we made a number of recommendations um, suggesting uh, improvements or compliance with human rights standards. Um, we had a body of recommendations related to protecting the right against refoulement, um, making sure that uh, there was specific protection um, for people who are in, um, in custody and are able, so that those people are able to exercise the right to seek asylum. Um, particularly paying attention to unaccompanied children and making sure that they understand their rights uh, to seek asylum, uh, that people have the right to access uh, counsel as they um, proceed through that, and that uh, importantly that U.S. Uh, officials are actually trained to ensure the rights to asylum and uh, protection against uh, return to torture. Uh, we also made a, a significant number of recommendations relating to detention and deportation of non-citizens. Um, excuse me. Uh, one area of concern has been a growing number of people being charged criminally for uh, entry offenses uh, into the United States, uh, that, that criminalizing of migration. Um, another area that we have seen uh, increased growth over the last uh, decade and two in particular, but, but certainly recently, has been the use of privately owned prison facilities to detain non-citizens. Um, uh, we've made recommendations to end that use um, to provide medical, rehabilitative, and educational services to people holding, uh, to prisons holding non-citizens. Uh, and to make sure that people have access to counsel, again, uh, not only in ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Detention Centers, but in short-term border detention centers. And uh, to make sure that the U.S. limits the uh, uh, use of segregation or um, uh, solitary confinement and other conditions of detention that are uh, problematic, including um, 
including forced labor programs. Uh, those two bodies really related to non refoulement and to the uh, the conditions of detention uh, really brought up the bulk of our recommendations at this year's UPR. Thank you, Michelle. Um, now, in addition to those three topics, we also submitted a report jointly with the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty on the status of the death penalty in the U.S. And if you'd like to hear more about that and hear about the recommendations, many recommendations that were made to the U.S. on the topic yesterday, uh, you can join another live debriefing at 1.15 Central Time today on the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty's Facebook page, and Amy will also be participating in that. Um, just before we turn to taking a look at the recommendations that happened yesterday, I'm going to ask Carter to talk just a little bit about the advocacy activities that we engaged in after we submitted our stakeholder reports to the council. Yeah, happy to do so. So um, in terms of our lobbying strategy, it's fairly in-depth and actually started many months before this UPR session, which was, which was originally, which was originally um, scheduled for May. So we firstly identified countries to lobby. And to do so, we looked at past UPR cycles to see which countries made um, recommendations on the United States in general um, um, on um, immigration, human trafficking, and the death penalty, and police accountability. Um, so after doing so, we sent them a one-pager, which is a document that summarizes the major issues and, uh, and offers a list of our key um, recommendations. So we, we send these emails to, I believe, 93 countries, 125 if we include the death penalty countries. So a lot of the emails. So, so um, and, and um, we also include a list of um, works um, made, made um, at, 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 at the last time session. And so, um, is it, is it, is it um, is it, is it, is it, um, sorry about that. And, and then, so, um, uh, um, in September, we sent, um, more, um, emails to them. And then, so, um, and we had a series of side events that included, um, panels with our partners, with staff, with volunteers, which gave us another opportunity to present our, our the major issues and to offer, um, our, Recommendations. So, so we had five of these events, one of which um, had immigration, um, trafficking, and policing in the United States. And we were happy to have state delegations in attendance at these events, which um, from Angola, Belgium, Chad, France, and the Swiss delegation as well. So this form of lobbying allowed us to continue in our advocacy, even though we weren't able to do so in person. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. And if, you, if you're interested in seeing any of those um, side events where experts talked about our issues in detail, you can check our, our YouTube channel and all of those are posted there. Um, so with that, let's turn to yesterday's session. Amy, can you give us an understanding of what was going on? Sure, I'll give you a rundown. Now, each country gets three and a half hours, regardless of how many other countries want to make recommendations. So the United States, not surprisingly, was the most popular country for countries to sign up to make recommendations to. There were um, 116 countries that spoke. And so because of that intense interest in human rights issues in the United States, each speaker had just 55 seconds. So you can imagine that's a lot to pack in and you pity the interpreters because they're going really fast to try to get everything in before they get cut off at the end. Um, but despite the time constraints, we got really good coverage of our issues. But I think one of the unfortunate factors of the time constraints is they, the recommendations don't go into the level of depth that we would have hoped. So the recommendations are a bit more, I would say, top level, maybe superficial. And that's really by virtue of the time constraints of how this all works. But nonetheless, it's great to have coverage of these issues. So on um, immigration issues, there were, I think, 28 different countries that raised issues related to the rights of immigrants, migrants, and asylum seekers. Um, specific recommendations addressing trafficking and labor exploitation was just six that were specifically on that issue, in addition to several about uh, to ratify the um, Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers. So that those were additional recommendations. But I think that's up. I think there were only three in the last review in 2015. So that's great increase in attention. 
on police accountability and police violence, this was by far the most addressed topic in all of the interventions. I think for obvious reasons about what's happened um, in the United States most recently is really on the world stage. There were 53 countries that raised those issues in the review. So nearly half of the countries that spoke raise those issues in the form of recommendations. Um, and then death penalty, just to, to give you a teaser for that, there were 36 countries that raised the issue of the death penalty in their interventions. So um, that's what we had for sort of the top level summary of what happened yesterday during that exciting three and a half hours. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I, yeah, I was watching the live session yesterday morning. I was really happy to see so many countries making recommendations that lined up with our advocacy. Um, it was also especially interesting to be watching the presentation being made by the U.S. delegation in light of the results of the presidential election. Um, the Trump administration actually withdrew the U.S. from the membership uh, in the Human Rights Council last year, even though it's still participating in the review process. And the approach the administration is taking on many of these issues, especially on asylum and police violence and resulting demonstrations and need for police reform, is likely to be quite different from the approach that a Biden administration is likely to take. Um, so let's get started with looking at some of the interventions from yesterday and get some comments from our experts. Uh, we will start off with police reform, and I'll just mention that if you want to hear more about this topic, you can also join Amy and other members of the Minneapolis Civil Rights Commission for a further debriefing on this Thursday at 6 p.m. posted on the Civil Rights Commission's Facebook page. So we're going to start by taking a look at a couple of the comments from the government delegation about um, George Floyd and about the subsequent protests. So those will be relatively quick, quick clips, but they were mentioned early on in the um, discussion. And, and that's, I think, to the government's credit that they actually took on those issues. In a lot of UPRs, the government just kind of ignores things, brushes them under the rug. So first we'll go to the um, Deputy Secretary of State, Destro. Our society. The demonstrations over the tragedy of George Floyd's death this year have shown the world that Americans understand that they have the inherent right to raise their voices individually and collectively to demand that their government redress their grievances. And by adhering to our democratic principles, Americans are pursuing accountability for Mr. Floyd's death through the criminal and civil justice systems, while also debating and discussing the claims of systemic injustice at the heart of our current discourse. I would now briefly like to address two topics that arose during so now we'll hear from another representative of the U.S. delegation um, who has a slightly different take on protests. Or perhaps more nuanced approach to it. Let's see. And this is um, Alexander Maugeri, who's with the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice. Today, unfortunately, the aftermath of George Floyd's death has produced a second challenge to the rule of law. As Attorney General Barr has said, the Constitution protects the right to speak and assemble freely, but it provides no right to commit violence or to defy the law. While many have peacefully expressed their anger and their grief, others have hijacked protests to engage in lawlessness, violent rioting and arson, looting of businesses and public property, assaults on law enforcement officers and innocent people, and even the murder of a federal agent. Nonviolent protest has been a hallmark of American life for generations, including in pursuit of civil rights. And where protests give way to violence or destruction, we will hold the offenders accountable. So interesting juxtaposition of priorities and accountability. While I get the um, recommendations queued up, any discussion on those two interventions? Well, obviously, I think that the Deputy Secretary of State's take takes more favorable in terms of what we are looking for, um, you know, acknowledging the inherent right of Americans to raise their voices. And he specifically said we're pursuing accountability for George Floyd's death. He mentioned systemic injustice in the criminal justice system, all are things that we would agree with and that we made recommendations on. And then when you turn to the Civil Rights Division guy, he sort of took the focus, he reversed it and 
blamed the violence on the protesters and assaults on law enforcement officers, neglecting to mention that a lot of the law enforcement officers were the ones, you know, using lethal weapons and spraying tear gas and didn't touch upon that and didn't say much about the protesters to be there in the first place and what was the reason they were there. Um, so really interesting to hear, like you said, the juxtaposition of the State Department with the Justice Department. Well, I'm next going to play um, two clips, one from Argentina. And I think Argentina was the only one in its recommendations to mention George Floyd specifically. So I thought that was interesting. And then a clip from South Africa, which talks about, makes reference to the um, report that is going to be coming due um, next year on systemic racism in policing. So we'll play those two clips and then we'll have a broader discussion. But first up is Argentina. Argentina recommends to the U.S. 1. To ratify the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights aimed at abolishing the death penalty. To consider establishing a moratorium on all executions as a first step towards official abolishing of the, abolishing of the death penalty. To commute the death sentence for the Argentinian citizen Victor Saldano, who has been on death row since 1996. Secondly, to adopt all necessary legal and administrative measures to effectively investigate and punish cases of discriminatory police practices and the excessive use of force by law enforcement bodies, including measures to prevent murders such as that of George Floyd and to ensure that justice is brought when these occur. Thirdly, to adopt measures to combat structural discrimination. And fourthly, to revise or review all administrative measures that criminalize migrants who enter without any authorization. Thank you very much, Armenia. There you get a sense of the poor interpreters. Yes, I did like, thank you very much, Armenia. Yeah, um, yeah I, I did think um, in Argentina's um, uh, comments, I was struck by their, they were the one who called out um, one of our concerns around migration, which was the increased criminalization of migration and uh, criminal penalties. And that really seems in line with their greater body of concerns around um, overbreadth of, of criminal, uh, the use of the criminal law and, and law enforcement. Yeah, we really liked Argentina's statement because it pinged like all of our issues. You have the death penalty, you have immigration, and you have like um, have the structural discrimination as well. So that was reassuring. So next we'll do South Africa. Madam President, South Africa welcomes the distinguished delegation of the United States of America to this UPR session and respectfully make the following recommendations. To cooperate fully with the High Commissioner in the preparation of a report on systemic racism, violations of international human rights, against Africans and people of African descent by law enforcement agencies, as the HRC called upon all states to do in HRC 43.1. Adopt and promote a comprehensive national plan to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, including incitement to hatred. They take further steps to reform the criminal justice system, which seeks to, ref uh, to reform sentence laws, such as the so-called three strikes rule that have wrongly and disproportionately harmed the African-American communities with life imprisonment for nonviolent crime. South Africa further encourages the USA to ratify all conventions and other instruments it has committed to in its previous UPRs in 2010 and 2015 and have not done so yet. Mr. President, my dele delegations commend the USA in its efforts to begin to address some of its issues of racial profiling and excessive use of force by police and establishing improved police community relationships. South Africa wishes the United States of America a successful Thank relationship. you very much. Next Reactions? Well, I found it, given the amount of time they have, the amount that Argentina packed in there was uh, impressive, especially when you're thinking they hit on all three prongs of getting the criminal justice. You have investigation, prosecution, and punishment and accountability. Um, they mentioned structural, the structural discrimination, something our government denies is actually uh, a problem, but they, they hit on that. So um, I was impressed by how much they were able to pack in there and hopefully how much the U.S. government will have to work with. I was really glad to see Argentina and several countries specifically talk about the need to address structural racism, 
in law enforcement um, because the US, U.S. state report expressly said, we deny that there is systemic racism in law enforcement. I mean, we're not even acknowledging that that is a thing that exists. Uh, and um, Amy, I think you mentioned the report. Um, and, and just as a little background, you know, there was a, an unprecedented debate at the UN Human Rights Council and over the summer about systemic racism in, in the United States and the need for police reform and, and the problem of police violence, uh, which was sort of pushed by the African group of nations. And then um, ultimately there was a resolution adopted that calls for this report on the problem of systemic racism, but all of the references to the United States got scrubbed out of it before it was passed. So good to see these countries calling it out at the U.S. Review. And I, I wanted one thing that um, came to mind when I was listening to the initial um, remarks, uh, particularly by the U.S., was a, around uh, the right to protest. And one of, uh, in a related area, two countries brought up uh, concerns with migrant activists right to do their work um, and migrant human rights defenders to be able to be active um, without threats of deportation and I, I I found it interesting that both South Sudan and Peru brought that up um, in the greater context of freedom of speech and the right to assemble and in these um, these areas that we're dealing with when it comes to racism um, more generally in the United States. All right, should we go on to the next, next set of clips? I'm going to play um, recommendations from Costa Rica, Malta, and Nicaragua. So I'll play those three and then we'll discuss. Let me get my screen shared. Costa Rica would like to thank the United States for their presentation and with all due respect we would like to present the following recommendations. First, to adopt the necessary measures to combat racism and police violence and this would include the adoption of a comprehensive national plan to combat racial discrimination and to reform police surveillance at the federal, state and local levels. They must also ensure that the police forces abide by international principles on the use of force. Secondly, we recommend that they implement, that they honor the commitment that they took on in the Conference of Nairobi to increase official development aid for the prevention of female genital mutilation and child and forced marriage. Last, we would like to recommend that an open invitation be extended to special procedures. Thank you. Thank you, President. Malta warmly welcomes the delegation of the United States of America. We welcome the progress made by the United States on the reforms to the criminal justice system at federal level. We recommend the following. One, strengthen measures to prevent and combat violence, especially the rate of murder experienced by transgender women of color, as well as the violence experienced by the broader LGBTQ community. Two, continue to reduce the role of policing as a response to societal problems largely related to poverty, while investing in direct solutions to those problems that do not involve criminalization. Three, establish a moratorium on the death penalty at federal level with a view to complete abolition and to take measures to avoid racial bias in capital punishment. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. While we're queuing up that next one, I'll just mention that we, we see the people in the room now wearing masks, um, which they weren't having to do last week. The case numbers are going way up in Geneva, and that's why we're also seeing all these video statements instead of people being in the room. Thank you, Madam President. The Permanent Mission of Nicaragua recommends, one, the total closing of illegal extraterritorial prisons, and in particular, Guantanamo, 
a territory illegally occupied by the United States, to put an end to sanctions and unilateral coercive measures that undermine the sovereignty and self-determination of countries of the world, including in, our Ameri in the Americas, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Three, prioritize urgent measures to fight hate speech, discrimination, racism, and xenophobia, primarily in Latin American communities and Afro-descendant communities that face high levels of police brutality. Four, uh, ensure the enjoyment of human rights of min minorities and vulnerable groups in the country, especially those in deten migrant detention centers along the border. Five, respect the people of the world in their freedom and democratic development and their electoral processes that are constitutional. Thank, Thank you, you. Niger. A lot of great specifics in there. Carrie, what do you think? Um, well, I wanted to highlight Malta's, which I think might have been my favorite of the morning. Um, they're, I think they're, they were the only country to kind of get at the root of the problem and to see, ask us to address that, which was reduce the role of policing um, as a response to societal problems. He specifically mentioned poverty um, and then said, try to find solutions that don't involve criminalization. And, without having all the words that he could, I think he was referring you know, to mental health issues and trying to uh, make it less of a criminal problem, less of a policing problem and more of a societal poverty, mental health issue. Um, so I like to see a country kind of getting underneath it and trying to get at the root of the problem and we'll see if the United States can do anything with that. Yeah, I was struck by that as well. Um, you know, try to solve the problems, not criminalize them. <laughs> um, and and I was also struck by um, the call out around uh, tr violence towards trans and LGBTQ people. Um, huge problem um, that we have seen. You know, just multiple killings. Um, real activism here in the United States. Uh, and, and this is something that I, I fear we're not seeing as loud a voice of support globally around it. And so was very glad to hear Malta on that piece as well. Great. Um, are we, are we, do we have any more on that issue, Amy, or are we ready to move on? We can move on and talk about trafficking and we'll of course return to more immigration related issues as well. Um, there is somewhat intertwined with trafficking, but also we have a lot of other recommendations to take a look at. So um, next I thought I'd play three clips addressing trafficking and labor exploitation. We're going to look at Myanmar, Indonesia, and Nigeria, and then we'll discuss those. Madam President, Myanmar welcomes the delegation of the United States of America to the UPR Working Group and thanks them for the national report. We also welcome the successful U.S. election 2020, which was held recently. In constructive spirit, Myanmar recommends the following. One, consider ratification of core human rights treaties, namely CDOR, CRC, CRPD, and ICESCR. Two, step up measures to protect and ensure the rights of the migrants. Three, strengthen sanctions against employers who engages in unfair labor practices and ensure workers' rights are not violated. And four, address issues of racism, xenophobia, and bullying among children at schools. We wish United States a successful UPS. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. Indonesia thanks the delegation of the United States for presenting their national report. Indonesia welcomes the U.S. recognition of the need to overcome the challenges in ensuring fairness to all its citizens, including the minorities. We believe that the Sea Policing for Sea Communities Initiative is a positive step towards critical policing and criminal justice reform. In this cycle, Indonesia wishes to recommend the following. First, to strengthen efforts in preventing the excessive use of force by law enforcement officials. Second, to consider acceding to the Convention on Migrant Workers. And third, to strengthen its bilateral collaboration to abolish human trafficking and slippery in fisheries industries. We wish the United States a successful review. I thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Madam President. Nigeria welcomes the delegation of the United States of America and thanks it for the presentation of the Conflict Third Cycle UPR National Report. We commend the Government of the United States of America for its continued cooperation and commitment to the UPR process. In the spirit of constructive engagement, Nigeria recommends the following for the consideration of the United States of America. One, continue efforts in combating human trafficking and ensure the protection of the rights of victims of trafficking and as, as well as the rights of migrants. Two, adopt further measures to ensure the enjoyment of human rights by all without discrimination. We wish the United States of America a very successful review process. I thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Great. Lindsay, um, what are your thoughts about what we're hearing here? Yeah, I was happy to see that um, all of the folks who are highlighted in these videos incorporated both migration and trafficking because I think that's where we see a lot of intersection. Migrants are particularly vulnerable to trafficking and then in the U.S. with kind of increased enforcement. Um, despite the U.S.'s um, statements in the UPR um, and elsewhere that it's really focusing on anti-trafficking in its immigration work. I think we're seeing in our work specifically that um, migrants are particularly vulnerable for, because of anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, as we recommended, the, the need for employers, sanction against employers really um, was highlighted by Myanmar and um, also in our report, I think a lot of trafficking comes from the fact that we don't um, target employers and instead target employees um, in some of these issues. and. Um, our, our efforts and the work of Satul and others uh, are, are hopefully highlighting that. Um, when I looked through as well, um, some of the recommendations and comments, it seemed that about four um, different countries had highlighted praise for U.S. anti-trafficking efforts and that U.S. statements were really um, positive on the U.S. impact on anti-human trafficking. So I was happy to see that Indonesia and Nigeria specifically um, recommended that the U.S. step up its efforts um, and Nigeria's specific focus on protecting the rights of victims of trafficking because I think what we've really seen is that um, U.S. efforts have been on targeting trafficking and then kind of leaving uh, victims with gaps in our immigration system. The U visas are particularly um, over uh, used or um, over needed and there aren't enough of them available um, and we're not seeing that the U.S. is really granting visas for trafficking victims either. So, so recognizing that need for, vic for protections, not just anti-trafficking efforts. I'm also happy to see, um, I've noticed uh, a number of the countries, quite a few countries actually, were um, specifically recommending that the U.S. sign and ratify many of the UN, uh, the human rights instruments that it, it hasn't yet done. Um, and I think many people assume that since the U.S. was one of the, you know, founding forces behind the U.N. that we're parties to all those treaties, and we are in fact not. Uh, and one of the ones that was specifically mentioned in those clips was the Convention on Migrant Workers. Um, and I was glad to see that specifically brought up too. Yeah, I was, uh, in particular, I really heartened to see the attention being paid to the Migrant Workers Convention. The United States has not signed um, or begun that process. And um, it, it, I think, really reflects, that convention really reflects a forward-looking view of migration um, and how, as a global community, you know, kind of aligned with the 21st century global compact and, and other responses, how we're going to deal with migration um, as a reality of a global economy and a global environment and, uh, you know, really moving past the, the um, kind of previous 50 years that we've been stuck in regarding migration protection. So uh, seeing that attention being called not just to migrant workers um, in the workplace, but the migrant workers protections um, really extend to the, the full panoply of workers, um, regardless of nationality that attach. Very, very good to see that. And I think five countries uh, specifically called on the US to ratify that. So I think we'll do a move to a deeper dive into immigration related issues. And I thought it would be helpful to play a little bit of the government's position during its presentation on migration. It's you know kind of what you would expect, but we'll nonetheless play a little bit of it. And um, then we'll move into hearing some recommendations on immigration asylum related issues.
As President Trump has said, mass illegal migration is unfair, unsafe, and unsustainable for everyone involved, the sending countries and the destination countries. The receiving countries are overburdened with more migrants than they can responsibly accept, and sometimes the migrants themselves are exploited, assaulted, and abused by vicious coyotes, the criminal human smugglers. Recent years have seen a humanitarian and security crisis along the U.S. southern border with Mexico due to a dramatic increase in the number of aliens we have encountered. From 2017 through 2019, the United States saw a record number of illegal aliens entering our country, largely for economic reasons, as we do still today. Remember, it was just a short time ago in 2019 that the United States recorded several months when over 100,000 illegal aliens each month crossed our borders and were released into our communities. The Trump administration took decisive action to strengthen our border wall system, address unintended consequences of laws and judicial rulings, and work with neighboring countries on regional trends. I guess we'll stop there with the, I wanted to get the border wall system part in. Um, so while I get some of the recommendations queued up, any responses to that statement? Any surprises there? Well, certainly no surprises. I think um, that is a very consistent message that uh, this administration has carried forth um, from its uh, campaigning through to it, uh, certainly has made good on in its actions. Um, and I, I think we were um, exchanging some notes ahead of time around the, the comment that receiving countries are overburdened and sort of the irony of that overburdened assessment uh, when the majority of the world's refugees, for instance, are, help, are you know, being uh, cared for in neighboring countries, not the United States. Um, we have about 20 million uh, to 25 million refugees who are um, going are in, in prolonged indefinite refugee situations protracted in neighboring countries um, with little sight of resettlement worldwide. Uh, I think about one half of 1% of the world's refugees may get resettlement offers in a year. Um, most are next door to countries that are already in strife. Um, you know, so perhaps that was a, a an apt uh, statement uh, by the government, but I think it was referring to a red herring in the case of the United States. Yeah, I think that was pretty consistent with their um, rhetoric that most of the migrants are coming as uh, economic migrants, whereas we know from our work that many of them are actually coming as asylum seekers or in other capacities. So kind of just terming them that and then I love that they're consistently saying that there's this crisis along the southern border when um, a lot of that has been created by the U.S. Remain in Mexico policy, um, also known as the migrant protection policy, which is lovely. Um, and, you know, just this creation of an, an issue that they then are able to use as um, a reason to heighten enforcement. Well, I thought I'd play three segments and there were a lot of recommendations related to detention of migrants. Um, and I thought I'd play just three uh, um, recommendations that touch on those issues and then we can discuss those. We'll go to Thailand, Ecuador and Mexico and then we'll discuss those. Madam President. Thailand welcomes the U.S. delegation to its third UPR cycle. Thailand follows a series of police brutality that stem from racial inequality with concern, while welcoming the improvement of law enforcement practices, including through the executive order on safe policing for safe communities, we recommend the U.S. to further strengthen its measures to address police brutality in accordance with existing international standards governing the use of force. We also encourage more human rights education to law enforcement officers on tolerance and respect of racial diversity. We share the concern on the increase of negative narratives on migration and the stigmatization of migrants and refugees, resulting in more stringent migration policies. We recommend the U.S. to increase its efforts to protect migrants, especially those in vulnerable groups, including by seeking alternatives to detention for migrant children and ensuring access to basic services. Thank you.
Senhora Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. Ecuador welcomes the distinguished delegation of the U.S., and we thank them for the report. Ecuador acknowledges the progress made by the U.S. since the previous UPR cycle, including the strategy for the prevention of violence against women and programs aimed at combating human trafficking. In a constructive spirit, Ecuador respectfully makes the following recommendations. One, to protect the rights of children who arrive to the United States and to seek alternatives to the current detention system for migrant children, be these children unaccompanied or with family groups, and to ensure that they can remain with their parents. Secondly, to step up efforts to combat discrimination in all its manifestations and to eliminate the excessive use of force in police work, to crack down on any abuses in accordance with the law and to implement measures to prevent racial profiling. Ecuador wishes the U.S. every success in its UPR. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. We thank the United States for its report. We respectfully recommend the following. Adopt measures to eliminate discrimination and xenophobic discourse. Eradicate practices such as excessive use of force and racial profiling. Two, guarantee respect for life, dignity, and safety, as well as human rights of migrants and refugees. Ensure the conditions appropriate to detention centers. Prioritize family uh, unity and safeguard the best interest of the child. Three, def defer or suspend the death penalty and make more agile the adoption uh, in a federal court of the of compliance with the ruling from the ICJ in the Avena case. Four, detain illegal exportation of weapons to other countries. Five, ensure that all women have access to health, sexual reproductive health information. Thank you. That. Well, I, I think, you know, it was um, clear that there were some folks, uh, some of, of the uh, uh, countries who really keyed in on where I think the United States has sunk the lowest in its uh, human rights record, and that is around uh, the appalling loss of parents and children, uh, separation with no record of hundreds of children and the detention of children in, uh, as Iran characterized it as, you know, hold, stop holding kids in cages, I believe was their recommendation um, straight out of you know, the, the streets in the United States where people are asking for that very same thing. Um, it really is an appalling, uh, appallingly low floor to which we have, have sunk around a protection of migrants' rights. And I, I think what was uh, disappointing is that it shifted the discourse um, to to th that very you know urgent issue of detention conditions and uh, especially the detention of children, and uh, did not leave space for any recommendations really at all about the shrinking eligibility or access to the right to seek and enjoy asylum, and so. You know, while we can't fault any country for listing um, the detention of children <laughs> as a top area of human rights concern, uh, I was struck by the absence of any comment around the, the asylum system and real substantial rollbacks in that protection system that, that from our vantage point, really are out of sync with international obligations. So, uh, Lindsay, I don't know if you had a similar thought as you were reviewing the recommendations. Um, lots yeah, around attention. <clears throat> that's a really good point. I mean, I, I think that's reflective of our feelings as well, where we're just overwhelmed by this fire hose of changes and um, you know dismantling of all of these human rights protections in the U.S. Like, how do you pick one? Um, especially when you're trying to distill it into a short enough comment for the UPR. Um, but yeah, it's almost like the U.S. has um, protected itself from deeper um, criticisms by uh, sinking to the super low level that you're talking about, Michelle. Um, I was happy to see, though, that uh, they mentioned, you know, adequate detention conditions. I think it was interesting that no one mentioned particularly issues around COVID. Um, you know, we're seeing lots of migrants who have um, had terrible experiences with health-related issues, um, particularly 
particularly around COVID and with, um, you know, attempts to shut the border um, due to the pandemic, which is um, against international advice on best practices. Um, so I was surprised that no one mentioned that. Um, and then I, I think I was happy to see, though, the, the interplay of people recommending um, the Convention on, on Rights of Migrant migrant workers and their families in con, um, junction with these other recommendations around human rights generally for migrants. Um, but yeah, it did seem like it lacked a lot of uh, teeth because there's so much to, to touch on. Yeah, and one other area that jumped out at me is that the United States, of course, is not party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that is one area where other countries have been able to really, um, really protect the f unity of the family. And, um, and that is something that seemed of, of deep concern. And as we saw numerous countries asking the United States to, to get on board with the full range of human rights instruments, um, we remain now the only country that has chosen not to protect the rights of children in international law. So I think that's uh, impacting our migration stance in a, in a very dramatic way. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's just an unfortunate consequence of the of the UPR process. This problem y'all have mentioned about the you know the recommendations being limited to just the most vile and urgent sort of things that they have such a short time that everybody naturally focuses on whatever is the is on fire right now. Um, but I, I know that I've been recently to some um, some other uh, briefings and events at the UN where um, officials have have really zeroed in on questions about COVID, especially in detention situations. So, so we know that it is a, a fairly top level concern, but unfortunately in this process, we can't even scratch the surface to get, to get that far down. Right, and these are the oral statements, not the full statement of the, the country's uh, lists of concerns or, or recommendations for the United States. So I'll be interested to get into that and see if there's more that we can surface outside of the 55 seconds they were, or however many seconds they were given. Um, so. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know when these statements were written either, um, but yeah, just like in terms of timing, you know, Michelle brings up the 500 plus kids who have yet to be reunited, reunited with their parents. That was like, you know, a month or two weeks ago. Um, we had the whistleblower report around forced sterilizations in ICE custody that wasn't mentioned in um, anyone's statement. So yeah, lots of, you think, hot button issues as well that, that could have been touched on. Yeah, because it's a diplomatic process, oftentimes it takes a long time for everyone to like hammer out what the exact language is in the recommendation. So a lot of, it's, it's quite unusual that they'll respond to sort of breaking news um, just because of the slowness of the diplomatic process. But I do want to say that the, the Universal Periodic Review isn't the only United Nations tool for enforcing human rights. And in fact, next year, the uh, treaty body called the Human Rights Committee is scheduled to review the United States human rights record and there, these are experts making recommendations and they're able to go into much more depth, uh, both in terms of the dialogue with the government being reviewed and in terms of the recommendations they make. So we, we want to make sure that as the advocates always does, we, we make use of all the different tools that the UN gives us for doing this kind of advocacy. This is just one. I thought I'd play two more clips and then we'll wrap up. We're going to go to Peru and Venezuela. Very much. I give the floor to Peru. Madam President, Peru welcomes the delegation of the United States and we thank them for their presentation. In a constructive spirit, Peru recommends first strengthen the standards on the background verification for the private transfers of firearms. Two, develop measures that allow for human rights defenders of immigrants to freely exercise their profession. Third, to ensure that the detention of and separation of migrant families and asylum seekers be not be used as punitive measures, as deterrence to the irregular entry into the country. Thank you very much. Gracias.
We recommend that the United States should, one, repeal the odious unilateral coercive measures imposed on Venezuela and other sovereign states, to establish a public system ensuring people's rights to health care, which has been decimated by the pandemic, to end state terrorism, punish those who commit murder, torture, disappearances, and use lethal force and violence against Afro-Americans and ethnic minorities, to complete the zero tolerance policy and protect the rights of migrants, to bridge the wage gap and end gender violence, ensure access to justice and reparation for victims, to ratify all of the uh, human rights conventions and protocols, ILO conventions, the Statute of Rome and to cooperate with the ICC, to close Guantanamo and ensure the right of inmates. Thank you. Venezuela had a lot to cover. <laughs> uh, Michelle and Lindsay, thoughts on those? Well, I, again, Peru, I think, brought up that question around um, human rights defenders. And um, you know, we have had over the years, just in, in our community, um, several people who have been targeted for arrest or been arrested um, who, on immigration charges who have been really prominent members of the, the um, immigrant community in activists. Now, this stretches back for decades. Um, but, it, and there's certainly, it's not confined to this administration, but it's such a vulnerability um, for uh, human rights defenders to, you know, to be public when the, the very status, that the very thing that they're advocating around could get them expelled from the country. And, and to really be mindful of the heavy handed nature of that, I think is, is really um, very critical to fostering uh, constructive dialogue and in moving forward, especially when we value the participation of those most affected by policies. I think too, you know, um, thinking of the human rights defenders in this context of migration, so many attorneys who have been volunteering to help um, people who are seeking asylum, refugees, uh, and especially at the border, they've oftentimes been blocked uh, from, from reaching people to offer their representation. I think a lot of uh, people in the U.S. don't understand that these people are not entitled to get a lawyer and it's only by allowing access to volunteers that they can be represented. Yeah, and this has been particularly precarious for people um, detained outside of the United States um, in, you know, sort of in makeshift camps awaiting adjudication of their asylum cases in the United States. And, and this is something that's, you know, promising to go on for a long time at the rate of adjudication. Um, it, it just the, the question around access to counsel came up in a number of the detention conditions reports around here um, that we saw. Um, so I, I think that it's something we really need to pay attention to. And, you know, like in the death penalty situation, access to counsel is sort of the last ditch effort um, to provide access to justice. And, and um, you know, it's a highlight for this year's um, World Coalition Against the Death Penalty activities. It's certainly in the immigration side, uh, very, very desperately needed. And it was good to see that called out. Yeah, that was, that was good. I also appreciated Peru's um, note about attempts or, or government actions that are aimed to deter irregular entry. I think it, again, it misses the, the point that they focus on family separations and detention. And we're seeing lots and lots of different government policies that are aimed at deterring irregular entry and punishing asylum seekers. Um, you know, so much goes on once somebody's even in the U.S. and um, that's not really being focused on. It's all a very much focus on the border issues and um, kind of what's in the news and highlighted, but we're, you know, seeing all, even in Minnesota in our immigration courts, you know, just a lot of tightening of regulations and restrictions that really do harm asylum seekers and um, migrants. Yeah, and, and the use of detention and family separation as a deterrent to seeking asylum, which is really what uh, largely the irregular migration patterns have been around uh, into the United States, um, it was, you know, tried under the previous administration and found to be illegal. Um, it, it is you know, has even been recognized as a violation here. And, and so um, making sure that we're not uh, 
pretending it's one thing and uh, using it as a deterrent uh, certainly is something I was glad to hear that uh, the delegation point out. Carrie, any last thoughts based on your work on asylum issues? I was just going to bring up that last point is that uh, she, I think, was it Peru, called out the um, don't use it as a method of, of deterrence because I was thinking, I wonder, you know, did she just hear about Jeff Sessions? I mean, he stated it. Jeff Sessions said that that is, was the purpose of it. And I'm glad to see that called out because that is about as low as you can go in terms of protecting the human rights of the most vulnerable. So I am hopeful that a new administration on all of these issues will be able to respond to these recommendations in a much different way than would be if we still had the same administration. And I am hopeful for progress. Okay, well, we have seen a good cross-section of recommendations on all three of our focus issues. Amy, what happens next, and how's that likely to be impacted by the election? Yeah, so the government receiving the recommendations has until March to decide what to do with the recommendations, to accept them or to reject them. And so with a new administration, that there will be a, a task to handle right away early on to decide what to do. And so for any of you watching, this is a chance to mobilize, to really encourage the government to accept these recommendations. That can be something that they can take on in day one. Um, and you can also join us in thanking the governments for making recommendations on these issues. If you go to the Advocates for Human Rights Twitter feed, you'll see our tweets where we mention the the uh, permanent missions in Geneva that made these great recommendations and you can reply and thank them as well. Join us in thanking them and that's a great way to have some positive reinforcement for these diplomats who spared some of their precious 55 seconds to talk about these issues. So that's another way that you can get involved. Great. Thank you, Amy. And thank you to all of our fabulous panel members for all of the insightful comments today. Um, and to our staff members and uh, everyone, don't forget to tune in 115 if you're interested in the death penalty on the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty's Facebook page or Thursday evening at 6 p.m. If you'd like to hear more about police reform on the Facebook page of the Minnesota Civil Rights Commission. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.